chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Today we're going to hopefully cover verses 5 through 18. Hebrews 10. And uh, let's begin there with verse 5. We'll go down to verse 14. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Uh, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stand daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is one of the greatest anti-Catholic sections in the most anti-Catholic book that's ever been published in history. It's the King James Version of the Bible. If you don't think the King James Bible is an anti-Catholic book, Read through the Epistle Dedicatory in the front of your Bible that was written by the translators to King James in 1611 when they completed their work. If your Bible publisher was brave enough to even include it, let me read to you a couple of sections, only about a page and a half, and some Bible publishers shy away from it. They don't want to print it anymore because it's considered hate literature by some liberals in the world today. But uh, they commended the king for his love of God, his interest in the translating of his Bible, and his support of the preaching at the church. And they write about this book that he commissioned to be translated. And they say about King J uh, James, that the zeal of your majesty toward the house of God doth not slack or go backward, but is more and more kindled, manifesting itself abroad, in the farthest parts of Christendom, by writing in defense of the truth, parentheses, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed, and every day at home by religious and learned discourse, by frequenting the house of God, and so forth and so on. In 1611, that man of sin was a direct reference to the Roman Catholic Pope. And they say later on, so that if on the one side we shall be produced by popish persons at home or abroad who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people whom they desire still to keep in ignorance and darkness so forth and so on so they refer to the Pope as that man of sin and popish persons whose desire was to still keep people ignorant and in the dark about the Word of God and that's considered hate literature by the modern world and by Roman Catholicism. But um, beginning in verse 5, Wherefore when he, that's Christ, cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou, that's God the Father, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, as a body of flesh and blood. Uh, then he quotes from a wonderful prophecy back in Psalm 40. Go back there, if you will, to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. And let's begin reading there at uh, verse 5. We'll go all the way down to verse 17. Psalm 40, beginning at verse 5. 
Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. My iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of thine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha! Let all those that seek thy salvation be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing, O my God. This is a great example of how the Word of God can have double and sometimes triple applications. And this is a great example of it. Uh, here you have the first immediate application would be to the life of King David himself and his surrender, his submission to God. Verse 8 there said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And that's King David speaking. Secondly, you have the um, first advent, the first coming of Christ application um, and his prophetic death for the sake of sinners. And then thirdly, you have a an application which will find its fulfillment in the third, the second advent of Christ, the second coming. Look here at verse 14, back again. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. That will find its ultimate fulfillment in the coming again of Jesus Christ. Notice in our text once again, verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Paul even saw that the fulfillment of that passage in Psalms went beyond uh, just King David. And it had its ultimate fulfillment in the coming of Christ and his death on the cross for sinners. Christ prayed uh, to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, Not that I will, but what thou wilt, Mark 14, verse 36. It was God the Father's will for Jesus Christ to die on the cross for sinners. It was his will that Jesus should come into the world and die as a perfect and a pure sacrifice on behalf of imperfect and impure sinners. And what did Christ's sacrifice accomplish? What did it effect for us? Look at verse 10, of chapter 10 here. By the which will, that is God's will and Christ's will, in agreement, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Wow. Also look at verse 12. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Also notice back in verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And also, look down at chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated 
for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So, the first order of the Levitical priesthood is superseded by the priesthood of believers. We talked about that a couple weeks ago when I talked about helping the Catholic Church priesthood to expand by recognizing the priesthood of all true believers, which was, uh, which of course they don't do and won't do. But, you know, I offered advice. If they don't want to take it, it's their problem. Anyway, um, look back at chapter 1, Hebrews 1. Um, and verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Run back, if you will, to the book of Amos in the Old Testament, the little book of the prophet Amos. Not famous Amos in the chocolate chip cookies, but it's a different Amos. Amos in chapter 3. Amos 3, and I'll call your attention to one verse there. Actually, Three verses. Verses 6, 7, and 8. Amos 3, verses 6, 7, and 8. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Well, obviously they will be. Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? Well, what men call evil, God might just consider just due judgment, due, due punishment. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And it's Amos 3, verse 7, that the churches such as the Mormons use to justify the need for prophets today to speak the, speak the words of God to the people and to represent God to the people as some sort of intermediary between God and the common folks, and that is a system of prophets. And that's a verse they'll run to. But look back at Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners, speaking time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Well, don't you call your church the church of latter-day saints? Well, this clearly indicates that Christ supersedes the need for prophets to act as intermediaries between the people and God. He speaks directly to men uh, through Jesus Christ and by the record found in his book. This is why we, we consider the Bible so important to us. Is this is God speaking directly to us. We don't have to have someone else uh, read it to us or someone uh, tell us what it says or interpret it for us. The same Holy Spirit who inspired the writers and inspired the Bible is the same Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. And he works through your heart and your conscience. He works in your mind and your understanding. As if you haven't burned it all out with drugs or something like that. He works in your mind and he renews your mind. And uh, he can teach you his book. No one else better to teach it to you than the Holy Spirit who wrote it to start with. He's the best teacher there is. And if you're faithful to reading it, being patient with it, praying over those things you don't understand until you get more light, God, the Holy Spirit, is your ultimate teacher. Now, he ordained ministers and pastors in the New Testament church. That's part of a functionality of the local church. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit, who inspired his own book, is the best one to teach it to you. And we have people all the time contacting us through the Internet, saying, I live out in boondocks somewhere, there's no local church, uh, how am I going to learn the Bible? Get your nose in the Bible and ask God to teach it to you. <laughs> how do you think someone else learned it living out in the sticks somewhere, out in the desert somewhere, they had no one else to teach them? There was a missionary who went to Africa, and I forget his name, now it's, it's a true story, 
And uh, his missionary board, he was considered sort of a flop and a failure. He wasn't there very long, and because of health reasons, had to come back to the United States. He led one, oh, uh, one young black woman to the Lord Jesus in a very remote village and gave her a copy of the Bible. Years went by, and missionaries decided they were going to enter into that area once again, where no missionary had been in decades. They got there, and they found the locals organized into a local church. And one old lady in the tribe by that time had one old tattered copy of the Bible. That's all she had. And through that, they were able to study the Word of God, learn what it meant to be a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. And she led other people to the Lord Jesus Christ with that one Bible. No other person teaching her, helping her, leading her, guiding her. Ultimately, the Holy Spirit has to open your eyes to the Scriptures and teach you how to understand it as you go. <clears throat> But, uh, and the Holy Spirit is ultimately your teacher as well. But the Lord Jesus supersedes the need for a priest uh, or a prophet on behalf of the people to go in between. Um, and um, his death also supersedes uh, the daily sacrifices of the animals in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. Look back at chapter 9 for a moment. If Christ's death on the cross wasn't powerful enough, if it wasn't sufficient enough to cover all of your sins by his death on the cross of Calvary, look at chapter 9, and notice what verse 26 is. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That is the, the nature of the Roman Catholic Mass that the death of Christ happened once, but it needs to be repeated, and it's repeated by their priest, by their duly recognized priest and ordained priest, uh, in the form of bread and wine. As though it wasn't sufficient once, and once only, it has to be repeated every day in the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, um, chapter uh, 10, verse 11 and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Back in chapter 9, verse 22, he's referring to the Old Testament sacrifices. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. There is a difference between remission and removal. There's a distinct difference in the English language between the word remission and removal. As far as the sinner goes, remission meant his sin would be forgiven and pardoned at that time, but it wouldn't be removed from his permanent record. So when God saw it, he would see the guilt of that sinner. That sin might have been um, forgiven if he was obedient to bring an offering uh, to the altar and let the Levites sacrifice for him. Um, but it was still on his record. The thing about the Christian is that sin is completely gone. Christ no longer sees it. He sees you covered with the perfect sinless righteousness of Jesus Christ. And as I said in our church hour, it's a transaction that happens that quickly by faith. His righteousness is put upon you. Your sin is put upon him. Even 1,900, 2,000 years after the fact, after his death, it's still effective to cover your sins today. And a great transaction takes place. But uh, notice verse 12 again. In the New Testament church, we have pastors and teachers and elders, but we don't have priests. We don't have anyone as a mediary, intermediary to offer offerings on our behalf to please God for us. You go directly to God if you have a problem, if you're a Christian. And any church that depends upon the, the role of priests to do the job uh, instead of the Christian having direct access to God, that is not a New Testament church. It's a fraud. It's a counterfeit.
but it's unbiblical. Notice verse 12 again. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, I wrote this up, and it's probably crude, and you won't be able to read it from sitting in the back. But this is what the King James Bible says in verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, sat down on the right hand of God. The old Catholic Douay Reims Bible, English Bible, 1582, had almost the exact vocabulary. In fact, I think they did have the exact vocabulary. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, forever sat down on the right hand of God. The wording is identical. All they did was move the comma back eight spaces so that they leave the door open for continual sacrifices on the part of their priest. And they say that Christ now is seated forever at the right hand of God. And modern Catholic Bibles and modern language have continued that, that tradition. But a text without its context becomes a pretext. They rewrite.